Roy, it is it is my understanding that you spent eight years with the LA Lakers, the LA Kings, the Forum. Can you talk your crowning achievement there? I don't know if it's your crowning achievement, but 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 I'm sure people are appreciative. Founding the Laker Girls. Yeah. Well, that would probably be if in fact it was something that is still remembered and is still very visible, it would be the Laker Girls. Um, I was with the L.A. Lakers, the L.A. Kings, and the Forum. At that time, one man, Jack Ken Cook, owned the both teams and the Forum. So I was director of promotions, and so you did it all. Uh, the Forum, for those that remember, and we're talking 1975, they, they had a Wurlitzer organ, and that was the entertainment that would happen at every Lakers game or Kings game. And here I was, uh, 30 years old, coming from UC Irvine to the Forum as an executive. And I didn't think the Wurlitzer organ was really that exciting to play between time and during timeouts and so forth. That's all they had for that that's big all, building? That's, that's all they had was a Wurlitzer organ. Because remember, Jack Ken Cook was a very proper guy, Canadian. And so I went to Mr. Cook. I said, Mr. Cook, could we, you know, could... I'm thinking of some live music to bring, kind of get the excitement in the building. And then he would say, Roy, the Wurlitzer organ is a wonderful instrument. We will have just organ music. Well, I knew I wasn't going to win that fight, but I was able to find a, a guy from Southern California, California named Joe Tripoli, who was a very good organ player and his young guy, and he played some more upbeat organ tunes. And I hired Joe Tripoli to be the organ guy, organ player. So you were going to mess with that organ and one absolutely. way or another. And bring it up there. Well, <laughs> they're a funny story. And be, even before we're going to talk about the Laker girls, how I almost lost my job at Jack and Cook. I went to Mr. Cook and said, Mr. Cook, could I bring in some bands, high school bands to play before the game starts because I always feel that when you when as a fan if you walk into the building and there's some real live music being played it kind of gets the energy and he said well hey, that's fine with me but the world it's organ will play during the games so I sent letters out to a lot of high schools saying hey would you like to come and play pre-game at Laker games we got a number of responses and I'd send them 120 tickets whatever they would need and they would come and play, and it would be, it'd be a high school band with a lot of uh, snare drums and uh, uh, horns and so forth. And they were playing basic high school band stuff. Well, this, I remember this was a Sunday game, and those pe people that remember the forum, we had the forum scoreboard. And I had Costa Mesa High School Band was supposed to play. So I had a whole lot of other things I had to do before the game and so forth. So I wasn't thinking very much. And then all of a sudden, one of the ushers grabbed me and said, Roy, the scoreboard, they're calling you. And I saw on the scoreboard, Roy Engelbeck, please call security. So I go into the print shop, which was off the main floor, call them. And they said, Roy, at the tunnel, we've got the Costa Mesa band here, but they don't have any tickets. I'm thinking, wait a minute, I sent them tickets. So I said, hold them there. So I hung up and I called the box office. And I talked, box, I forget who called, I said, this is Roy, pull 150 tickets together, I don't care where they are, pull them now and get them to the tunnel, we got to get this band in here. Fine, do that. Those people that remember, even when Jerry Buss bought the team, Jack Ken Cook had a private box at one end on the second level, which is called the colonnade right there. And he had VIP guests there and so forth. So I'm going on doing my other things to get ready. And I could remember hearing, maybe 20 minutes later, the band starting to play. You know, I'm up in, in the building. So I said, good, they got that. All of a sudden, an usher gets me, Roy, um, your, your, your name's on the scoreboard. And it was, Roy, please call extension 424, which was Mr. Cook's phone up in his box. So I go into the print shop, close the door, and I dial this, and I'm holding there, and I'm like, what, Mr. Cook's calling? You don't want, you don't want your boss to call you. And I remember the, I could hear the phone being picked up, and all of a sudden I could hear the bass drums and the, and the uh, uh, tubas, boom, boom. I could barely put it by my ear. And, I, and he said, hello. I said, Mr. Cook, Roy Engelbeck, 
what are this, what's this band doing here? I've got Mayor Yorty here, get this man. And I could barely hear him because the, and what the box office guy had done, I said, pull him any place. He had pulled 150 seats all around Mr. Cook's private <laughs> box. And here's the Costa Mesa band. And the Mr. Cook said, Roy, I thought you knew better than this. Get this band out of here, clunk. I said, well, I didn't last very long here. So I ran up there. We got the band and moved them there. That's before Magic was there. So we had a lot of empty seats. So that was my, uh, that was my band um, music. And well, anyway. he still let you, even though that, that happened. The Laker girls are still going to happen. It's still going to happen. So fast forward to 1979. Mr. Cook moves to Vegas, and he sells the teams and the building to Jerry Buss. Jerry Buss. New, new to sports, he owned the tennis, the, the world team tennis team. And I remember the first, I want to say it's been so long, week or month, um, he called us all in, all the executives, and said, you know, I bought the teams and so forth, and you guys are running a good shop, and, you know, I'm new to this business, and I'm just wanting to do a great job and all of it. So I went to maybe the next week and got a meeting with him and said, you know, I've always felt that a dance team would do well here. And I don't mean, and this was 1979-80, when the NFL, the cheerleaders were a lot of TNA with the high boots, and right, they were right. kicks. They were basically cheerleaders. And I said, Doc, uh, Dr. Buss, I really want to not do cheerleaders. I want to do dancers. And I was very enamored with the USC song leaders, very bouncy and a lot of dance routines. And I said, I'd like to try that and see if we could put a dance team together. He said, Roy, <laughs> good idea, do it. Do it. So um, I went to USC and called the athletic department and said, who's in charge of the uh, SC song leaders? Not the cheerleaders, song leaders. They gave me a name. I called UCLA, athletic department, who's in charge of the UCLA song leaders? Found out. Called them and they had a contact person. I said, I'm looking to put a dance team together, not a cheerleading a dance team together. And can you have your leader call me? We did, and I picked a night, an afternoon at the forum when there wasn't a game going on, and I had these eight girls. No, I think it was two girls, Dolly Zachary and Lori Ryan. Lori Ryan was had been on the cover of Sports Illustrated as an SC song leader. Absolutely beautiful girl. Sat down and said, Girls. I've got the, okay, I want to put together a dance team, a Laker girl dance team. And no, the NBA had not done anything. This was brand new. Every NFL team had these cheerleaders. And they said, I don't want it to be a TNA. I don't, I want it to be very wholesome and upbeat. And they were so happy that we were not going to exploit them, even though back then it was TNA and it was much as you could get away, away, away with. Um, and are you interested? And I want to do it where we kind of have the girls from SC and UCLA. I want, let's do eight girls, four from each school. Can you do that? Boy, we can do it. So uh, we're a month or two before the start of the season. And I'm a firm believer that you never tell anybody in the media so that you're putting a dance team together. Because if you let the word out that, hey, the Lakers are going to get a dance team, everybody has their own preconceived ideas of what that should be like. Right. And when you break it and it's not like they thought, they don't like it. Or we it's can, like, what's this going to do to the play of the game? When is this going to happen? When absolutely. Is this? this was complete s secrecy. And I said, can you, how long is it going to take you to do one 50-second routine? Well, we get the girls together. we got to practice. It could take two or three months on it. Fine. We got them together. I found uh, uh, two designers in L.A. at the Garment District, named two ladies named Spicer and Spicer, met with them and I said, can you create one outfit? Purple, because we were purple and gold, yes. I had the girls go down. We didn't, this is before Nike would do anything. I just went to a store and bought, all the girls got their size, we, we bought them the same shoes. The season opened up and this was Magic's rookie year, but we were, had been coming off losing. We were not a very good Laker team at that time for those several years. And uh, I remember with Lori, well, we're not ready yet. So finally, I think maybe the fifth or sixth game, home game into the season, she came and said, Roy, we are, are we are ready. I said, fine, I'm not saying anything. And Lon Rosen, who was an intern for me, Lon now is executive vice president of the LA Dodgers and was also Magic's manager for a number of years. 
Lon was working for me, and a guy named Rick Orienza, who became the promotion director for the uh, Pittsburgh Pirates, they were interns for me. And the concept was that we would have the girls back in the hallway by the Lakers dressing room. We would have Rick Orienza under the basket with a walkie-talkie, and Lon Rosen with the girls with the walkie-talkie, and I would be calling the shots. And I said, the only way this is going to work and be accepted is if the Lakers have a streak of 10 or 12 points run in a row and there's a fast break and a slam dunk and the crowd goes wild. Because bringing the girls out when they're down by 10 points is no energy. Had the game. We lost the game. There was nothing that we could bring them out. Sorry, girls. We didn't do it. I can't remember with the next game. It might have been the next game, but here we are winning. I think it was the first quarter. And I remember Don, we had just scored like eight straight points. And Don Ford, who was from UC Santa Barbara, blonde-haired guy, stole the pass, went the length of the port, slam dunk, crowd went wild. They called a timeout. I said, with the time, I'm going to say code red. And that's when the girls come out. And when soon as Don, I saw him uh, steal the pass, go for the slam dunk, I knew this they were going to call a timeout, the opposing team. Call a timeout. He said, code red, code red. The music starts, and here are these Laker girls, these eight girls who no one knew about, go to the center of the court. The music goes on. They, they perform that, perform the dance, and I told the PA announcer then, all you're going to say at the end is, the Laker girls. They were going off. They came out, and I remember the crowd kind of murmuring. What? You could hear something. What's, what's going on? They came. They did the routine. He said, the Laker girls, they ran off the court, ran completely back in the tunnel again. And there was some, wow, yeah, some response from the crowd. They never performed again that night. That was it. And the next day in the L.A. Times, that's when we were covered, there was a little bit that, hey, last night the Lakers debuted their new dance team, the Laker girls. The next show, the next game, they came out again, did one routine, and went back. And it was only maybe after 10 games that they actually came and sat on the court and stayed there and performed. And here we are in 2019. The Laker girls are still idolized and still wow on But them. they're on the court all the I mean, they're on the court now all the time. I remember from going to see them at the forum yeah. and we're, I mean, they, they are, they're on the court the, court. All, the whole time. Now. But they didn't start that way. We just didn't want to. And they were just accepted because no one knew what was happening on that. And the second year we had a uh, we had a, we had some some girls left. Then we had Paula Abdul tried out and made the team. And I thought to myself, boy, you know, if I could take this concept to the other NBA teams, we would come in and and organize them and judge them and pick the girls. And had Paula Abdul, who at that time was a choreographer for Michael Jackson. And I remember calling Paula and said, Paula, I got an idea that we could take this. And she lived in the valley. And she said, I'd be interested in talking about that. And I remember driving up to the valley to a restaurant, and she had an old beat-up VW bug at the time. And I put a little proposal together. Paul Abdul, choreographer, and we'll come in the Dallas Mavericks. We'll charge you $3,000, and we'll do the whole thing. Well, we never could, because then she got a big job and so forth. But that was Paul Abdul, was one of those early girls. And... Uh, the Laker girls have been ever since then. And so I haven't pushed it too much because a lot has been read that Dr. Buss, one of the things that Dr. Buss did besides loving the players and winning championships, he was the founder of the Laker girls. He paid me. I bought him the idea if he wants to take credit for it, so, so forth. Now what's funny, those original Laker girls are grandmothers now. <laughs> so <laughs> I always, Because this has been 40 years. They're 60 years old. And they were beautiful girls. And I have some pictures in my office with the Laker girls and Magic as a rookie looking over my shoulder and so forth. But that was that's the story of the Laker girls. And our next podcast, we'll talk about the Laker band, which well, was also founded. Well, I just have one final question about mm -hmm. that. So Paul Abdul was a Laker girl. And you were talking to her about being a choreographer to go and create other teams for, I mean, right. I'm not sorry, create other dance teams for other teams. Right. Why Paula Abdul? Because um, I'm saying then she was just, I mean, she wasn't Paula Abdul then. No, but I think she was, 
she had credentials because she had done some choreography for Michael Jackson or someone. Oh, oh okay. And, and so she was more, uh, she was somebody that I could sell. Just saying, hey, this is Lori Ryan, who was a former SC song leader. I thought Paul Abdul gave us the credibility if we were going to pitch it to NBA teams. And we, we never did because Paul had got... Some, something else. She on. became Paul Abdul. But that was, and then she was only a Laker girl for the one year, and then she got, she started to dance, or I don't know what, what all happened. But I remember her, she didn't have much. She had a beat-up VW Bug, and this is before, you know, this is before they were famous, as you say. 